One of the highlights for me over recent months in our church here has been the addition of new babies in some of our families and into the church family. Now, they're not here this afternoon, but of course they were here this morning. It's wonderful, isn't it, to see the joy that little ones bring to their parents and even for me to just look on in the context of the church and to see the joy that little babies bring to the young girls and to even some of the dads and to the mums and to the teenagers. We all look on and we and we delight in seeing this. On at least one occasion I can recall in the previous months when my wife and I were sitting together down here um, during the service and it was early on in the little infants that have been with us and we just so much enjoyed hearing baby cries that we haven't heard in the congregation for some, some time and little nudge to each other in the service as we just delight to hear. And of course, mum scruffles and scrambles and tries to get the baby out to the, to the crèche before there's much disturbance but it's a delight to hear those little baby noises, as those squeaks and those squawks that are necessarily cries. It's a delight, it was a delight for me this morning to see some of those little ones asleep in dad's arms or mum's arms. We've seen them asleep in their strollers or on the floor or on a rug, fast asleep. And just to see them in their peaceful state is a delight for us. A newborn baby is such a marvellous little miracle of God, we might say. New birth is unique. It's a beautiful thing. I'm often staggered when we see beasts. And we might see the big full-grown beasts out in the field, out in the paddock, wherever. They're not that pretty. They're big brutes. But when you see a little one, they're cute. Even little cute rhinoceros, little cute... We've all seen them. New birth is a beautiful thing. And I am personally, this is a personal testimony if I'm allowed to say that, I'm personally so glad that my experience as a first time dad occurred in this generation when dads are allowed to be the birth of their child. That new birth experience has got to be one of the most amazing experiences in life. Well friends, I'd like to preach this afternoon on this very relevant subject of new birth. Did you say relevant? That the new birth is a relevant subject today? Relevant? When we're in perhaps possibly the, the worst global economic conditions since the Great you're saying this is a relevant subject? What about my job security? What about the rising living costs? What about the economic uncertainty that we seem to be going into as a country? The major economies in the world doing all that they can to try and stay off global recession. And you want to talk about new birth? New birth has nothing to do with the real problem this world is currently facing in its economic crisis. Relevant? Well, I'm sorry, if that's how you're thinking, I'd encourage you to think again. What is it that lies behind the subprime mortgage crisis in the US? What is it that lies behind the credit crunch, as it's been called, in our season? What lies behind this crisis? But people's sinful greed. Now, I know there are lots of other economic issues, but at the end of the day, it's sinful greed of people. In some cases, it's greed of institutions but it's human greed. The subject of the new birth or people being born again goes right to the heart of the problem, literally. 
Man's problem today isn't primarily global economics. Men's problem today isn't the rise of racial supremacy or religious extremism. As real as those problems are, that's not ultimately the problem. What this global village needs, what the West with their crumbling economies need, is not another economic stimulus package or interest rate cut. But Prime Ministers, Presidents, politicians and ordinary people like you and me experience new birth. Receiving a new heart and a new nature from God. For whatever the suffering there is in this world today, and there is much suffering, this temporary suffering that is happening in our world is nothing compared to the eternal suffering that will be experienced by people unless they are those who experience the new birth. Jesus said, we had it read to us before, in John chapter 3, Jesus said, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless you, unless I is the new birth, then we will not go to heaven when we die. Which means we will experience eternal suffering in hell. And however real the economic crisis and suffering might appear to be now, it will be nothing compared to the suffering that we will experience hell forever. Now the Bible teaches that each of us are born into this world spiritually dead. Yes, we experience, all of us have experienced physical birth. We probably can't remember it. I'd be very surprised if any one of us could remember it. We have experienced physical, we do have physical life. But due to sin, the sin that we have inherited from our first parents, Adam and Eve, we are born spiritually dead. And that's why we need to be reborn again. Or born from above. We need to experience personally the new birth so that we might be given spiritual life, given a new nature by God. For unless we are born again, we cannot see the kingdom of God. This evening, friends, we're going to focus on one verse in the Bible. And it's not where you think. It's not John chapter 3. It's James chapter 1. And I checked with Pastor Doug to make sure it was okay that I went into James chapter 1 because he's preaching through James. Not the clearance. James chapter 1, verse 18. James 1, verse 18. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we're kind of first fruits of his creatures. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Jesus said, you must be born again. Verse here in James 1.18 answers three questions for us about the new birth. Who, how, and why? Simple. It's in that verse. Who, how, and why? Think quickly. Who? Who does it? Who does the work of new birth? James says in verse 18, of his own will, he brought us forth. Who's the he? Verse 17 gives us the answer, the he is Father. So James says, God. Who? God. God chose, James is saying, this is what happens to Christians. God has chosen to give us birth. God decides who receives the new birth. You see, ultimately, we don't get born again because we want it or even we decided to be born again. It's not like, oh, I'm deciding now that I'm going to be born again tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. It doesn't work that way. It's not even when 
someone would witness to us or pray for us or someone may have brought us to a gospel meeting, something like this. The ultimate reason why some people are born again is because God chose to give them spiritual life. Of his own will, he brought us forth, he God, of his own will. So this is not something that is in, that, that God is induced by, by external, uh, an external cause. God purposes it, God does it. This is the deliberate, specific exercise of God's choice. The verse says, of his will. So that means, long before today, long before this Sunday, actually before the universe was created, God decided that he was going to love certain individuals. In his sovereignty, he's God, in his sovereignty, he picked out Not because there's something special in them. The verse says, of his own will, God said, I'm going to save her. I'm going to save him. I'm going to give them, these ones, I'm going to give them spiritual life. I'm going to take these ones to heaven. James says, God's will. Now it's not just James that says this. Paul says the same thing. In Ephesians chapter 1, many of us know this verse, verse 4 and 5. He chose us. This is what God did. God chose us, he says to the Christians, God in him before the foundation of the world. Having predestined, having determined our destiny beforehand, having predestined us to be to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to what? According to the good pleasure of God will. It's his will. It's his choice. It's his purpose. God chose to do it. Now why? Well that's one of those questions we don't have an answer for. Why did he choose some to do this for? Why did he love some? It's a mystery. The Bible doesn't give us the answers to some of these questions. Maybe someday when we get to heaven we may know the answers, but maybe not. So as we think about the new birth and we ask the simple question, who? We see the Bible's answer is, it's not in our hands to give birth, it's in God entirely. But it's not just James that says this, it's not just Paul that says this, there are other apostles who say this, John says this. The apostle John says in John chapter 1 and verse 13, he says, to those who believe in his name, who were born, not of God, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's similar language. He's actually speaking about being born again. Being born, he says, who were born. Those who are born, it doesn't happen due to their own will, John says. It's ultimately about a will, but not man's will. Ultimately, it's God's will. John 1.13 says, Born not of the will of man, but of God. God moves toward the sinner first. God must sinner willing in the day of his power. Now, this whole point that I'm simply trying to make and answer the question who is really obvious, really, when we just stop and think about the physical birth of a baby. What part does a baby play in being born? You say, well, that's obvious. No. What part did you play in your conception? What part did you play in your gestation being formed in your mother's womb? What part did you play in in, in your birth? Well, it was completely out of your consciousness. It was completely out of your control. You were, if you like, a passive recipient of the will and activity of someone outside of yourself. It was the decision and activity of someone else, namely your parents. So it is with being born again. You must be born again, Jesus says. But you can't do it. It's only something that God does in his good pleasure. Now, for those of you who are not Christians, is this not a puzzling thing in your mind? 
Is this not an alarming thing for you? Jesus says, you must be born again. And you understand, well, I must be born again. Otherwise, if I'm not born again, I won't go to heaven. I'm going to go to hell. But now you're telling me the Bible says that I can happen. That means I'm helpless. Exactly. You cannot make yourself born again. You see, this truth is designed to be puzzling to the human mind. That's to the human who likes to contribute to his or her own salvation. This truth is designed to make you stop and make you think of who you are compared to the great sovereign ruler of the universe. It's designed to send you to your knees. It's designed to send you straight to God. Him, I need you, God, to work in my life. I desperately need you, God, for without you I'm lost. I need you to do for me what I can never, ever do for myself. Salvation is not in your hands. Jonah tells us. Salvation, the Lord. And if God doesn't save you, my friend, you will justly go to hell. It will be what you deserve for rebelling against God. You need God right now. You see, this truth confronts us with our helplessness and our absolute dependence on someone outside of ourselves. And this is unsettling, isn't it? If you're not feeling unsettling, then you're not listening to what's being said. You're not understanding what's being said. This is an unsettling thing. We can't get to heaven without the new birth. And yet we can't make ourselves to be born again. It's distressing. It's disturbing even. It shows our real condition before God. You need God to do a supernatural thing in your life to make you a different person, to give you a new heart. That's something of the answer to him. Brings us into this and we ask from this one verse, how? How was it done? God is a sovereign God. And yet, friends, the sovereign God uses means or instruments or tools, if you like. Most of you can see this pulpit. Can you see this piece of furniture? This pulpit here, this lectern, was made by one of the men in this church. Now, to, to make this piece of furniture, he had to use tools. There were instruments in his hands to make this thing. He used carving tools that were used on the wood lathe to turn the the shape of of these two uprights and the circular parts at the bottom in which they are seated in. Now, I don't know all the tools that were used, but I can guess that there were saws. There were planes or planers. There were sanders. Tools in the craftsman's hands to make of furniture. Changing, if you like, a lump of wood into a new piece of furniture. Well, James says God uses tools, God uses means. And the ordinary means, or the tools that God uses, he mentions here in verse 18. Look with me, back in the verse. Of his own will, he brought forth how? By the word of truth. Now, in its broadest sense, that phrase, the word of truth, surely could mean all of Scripture, all of the Bible, all of this, from Genesis to Revelation and everything in between. Say to Timothy, Timothy, from your childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, those Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So if you're not a Christian, we we would urge you, to make sure 
you continually and continually regularly read the Bible. Even your children. You can read the Bible. Sections of the Bible. Ask mom and dad to help you. Which sections you should read more than others? And as you read, ask God to teach you what you're reading. And as you read, believe what you're reading. Learn about Jesus Christ in the Scriptures. The word of truth. And believe in Jesus like Timothy. But this term, the word of truth that James uses, perhaps has a finer definition as it's used elsewhere in the New Testament. It's used elsewhere to refer to the gospel, the good news. In Colossians 1 and verse 5, Paul says to those Christians in the church at Colossae, he says, you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Same thing he says of the gospel. Of the word of the truth of the gospel. Again, to the church in Ephesus, in Ephesians 1 and verse 13 he said, In him you trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So for those people in Colossae, those people in Ephesus, it actually wasn't so much what they read. Both those verses talked about what they heard. They heard the word of truth. They heard the gospel preached. The gospel is the word of truth. The gospel of truth. In the gospel we hear about God. In the gospel we hear about sin. In the gospel we hear about Jesus. In the gospel we hear about ourselves. We could go on, but certainly those are the four big things. You see, in the gospel we learn of the true God. That he is the creator of this world. That he is our, not only our creator, he's our judge. He's the one who sustains our lives. That he is loving and caring and amazingly patient. He's also holy. And his standards are holy. So in the gospel we learn truth about God. In the gospel we told truthfully about our sin problem that you and I have fallen far short of God's standards, that we justly are under God's condemnation because of our selfishness and because of our rebellion to him, to his ways. But the gospel is also good news because it's truthful news about God's son, Jesus Christ. He came into this world and lived a sinless life, keeping God's law precisely and perfectly. And yet this Jesus died on the cross. His own sins, because he was sinless. But he was punished for the sin of the people he came to save. And the gospel tells us that we ourselves must turn from our sin and place our personal trust in this Jesus through the gospel. The word of truth that God brings people to life. God gives the new birth. James again says, of his own will, he brought us forth. How? By the word of truth. It's by believing the gospel, friends. The word of truth. It's by believing that that you can be saved. That give you spiritual life in the new birth. You see, the new birth is not about getting new knowledge. It's not about getting new religion. But it's getting new life. We had read to us before the story in John chapter 3 of a man who was Nicodemus. Nicodemus came to Jesus one night. Nicodemus was a religious Jew. He was very religious. He was right up there when it came to the, the whole structure of Jews. He's a leader of them. He was very religious, but he had no life. Yes, he may have been religious, but what he needed was not more religion. He needed a new birth. Because it was to Nicodemus that Jesus says, you must be born again. Nick needed what you and I need. Life. Spiritual life in the new birth. You see, the problem with each of us, the problem that each of us have 
in our natural state is that we are born with that which is corrupt, virtually dead. Our nature is corrupt. The Bible describes the inner person in terms of having hearts of stone. Dead hearts within us. Hearts that are unfeeling and unresponsive to spiritual reality. I'm not sure whether children have pets. Some of you I do know have pets, but I don't know whether you have a pet rock. We had a little discussion. I had a discussion with each of my children this afternoon. and I could remember someone in the past when they were younger, pet rock, and I think we discovered who that one was. I won't say who that one was. Deliberately not saying he or she. That one has removed that pet rock from the little collection box. That person has moved on from pet rock. I was hoping that that pet rock was still available that I could have brought it along and shown you. You have to imagine that I have the pet rock in my hand. Let's call him Peter. Peter, the pet rock. You know, a pet rock might be the type of pet that like because a pet rock doesn't eat much. And when it's time to go away on holidays, a pet rock isn't really a problem. Just put them in the cupboard and let away you go. But your pet rock can't talk, can it? It can't feel. It can't respond to you. Why? You say, Pastor, it's obvious. Because a rock doesn't have life. It's dead. It's lifeless. Each of our hearts are just like that. Our hearts are dead and unrelated to spiritual things. But in the new birth, God takes away that heart of stone and he gives a heart of flesh. That is, it's a heart which can feel, if you like. It can respond with passion. It can respond with desire to spiritual truth and the beauty in Jesus Christ. It's in believing the gospel that God gives a soft, living, responsive, feeling heart instead of being lifeless stone. In the new birth, our dead, stony boredom with Jesus. Some of you are bored with Jesus. It's all. But in the new birth, our dead, stony boredom is replaced by a heart that has a spiritual senses to the great worth, to the exquisite beauty of God's Son, Jesus Christ. The new heart treasures Jesus above everything else. The new heart is being transformed by God's Spirit to become like Jesus every day. The new heart is given the energy by God's Spirit. The new heart is is given desires to be obedient and to do the will of God. God promised in the Old Testament, the book of Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26, God promised this, he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my stand. You you shall keep my judgments to do them. How does he do that? How? James tells us that the sovereign God does it by the word of truth. He sends his spirit, which is the spirit, and accompanies with effectual power the word of truth when the gospel is proclaimed. And may it be that the Spirit comes even now and takes that word and gives it like wings that it would drive to our hearts. How? Spirit-empowered gospel reception. Question number three and we're done. Why? What's the purpose? For what purpose are people born again? Once more, we find our answer in James 1, verse 18. Notice the purpose clause at the end of the verse. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the will, so that, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now, I have a challenge right now. <laughs> What's first fruits? 
You see, this reference to first fruits is not something that I think we IGA in Rosewood. This term, first fruits, is not something that we are familiar with in our culture. It's not a common expression. But in Bible times, it was a common expression. So what does it mean? Well, this first fruits is drawn from the Old Testament. We're at harvest time on the farm. The first fruits or the first pickings of the crop were regarded as especially belonging to God. So the first fruits were God's special property. And it was actually, if you like, set apart for God, dedicated to God. It was consecrated to God. So when God saves someone in the new birth, that person in a special way gives themselves to God. That life is dedicated to God. They are no longer their own, but they become willers of God. They live for him. God transforms their lives. They, if you like, become different people. The first fruits was dedicated to God, but the first fruits were the best. It was of the finest quality, those fruits. It was the freshest, tastiest. It was the beautiful. It was the most succulent of all of them. And friends, here is God's glorious purpose in giving the new birth to remake us. To make us all over again into glorious, perfect, beautiful, amazing human beings. Paul says, if in Christ Jesus he is a new creation, all things have passed away, behold, all things become new. Now, ours is certainly the day of the makeover, isn't it? So many different television programs have carried this. Now, when I was recently overseas, I didn't spend much time watching television, but I did notice that they have similar programs there as we have here. A team will come in and give your home a makeover. Maybe, ladies, you like that to happen. You can have your backyard. You can have a makeover. Your physical appearance can receive a makeover. Your body shape can have a makeover. Well, here, friends, is the ultimate makeover of all time. God making us a new people, a different people giving us a new heart, a new nature, making us people like Christ, a new creation. But the first fruits was also the promise of a greater harvest still to come. It was only the first fruits. There will be more to come. It's just the first of the pickings. If you come to my place for a meal I'm not committing ourselves to this but if you come to our place for a meal and my wife says that there will be three courses tonight that's why I just said what I did when the entree or the appetizer is put in front of you you know it's only the first course there's more But if you actually didn't hear her say that this is only the appetizer and it gets put in front of you and you think that that is the meal, you might be thinking, well, this is good, but you're really deep down a bit, didn't it? I mean, is this all I'm going to get for tea? And I'd say to you, no, dummy, it's just the appetizer. There is more to come. It's just the first course. And those who are born again, first fruits, they are designed to show, if you like, a little bit of heaven to the world around them. And in that sense, those born again are to be like appetizers. This is good, but there's far more to come. The first fruits are like a of greater things, well, glorious things, yummier things, still to come. Those who are born again show to others around them what God can do with a human life. 
But we only get to see the first fruits now. There's far more yet to come. We only, if you like, have the appetizer here in this world. The best is still to come. Perhaps you sit here tonight and you're not a Christian. The Christians. Maybe, maybe it's your mum, it's your dad, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's someone at work. You have seen something in them that you do not have yourself. And you know that. My friend, what you see in them is Christ. Christians are appetizers for heaven. You see in them what awakens in your soul a hunger and a thirst for spiritual things. You see in them what could happen to you. God giving the new birth through the word of truth, the gospel. It's in the new birth that a person is recreated, made over, given a completely new nature, a new heart, a heart of flesh. It's a change from the old nature of sin and to a new nature of holiness and life. And with this new birth comes new life, new energies, new perspectives, new priorities and wonderfully new prospects. And above all, Relationship with God through Jesus Christ, his Son. Why are you here tonight? Well, perhaps God has brought you here tonight so that you can be born again. So that you might take seriously what God says in his gospel about his son, Jesus Christ, that he died for sinners like you. You might take seriously what God says in his gospel about you, your selfishness and your rebellion and your need to turn from your sin in this Jesus. My friend, you must be born again. You can't do it. You can't do it. But God certainly can And he can do it for you tonight, right now. May you call out in prayer in your helplessness. Lord, give me a new heart. Lord, save me now, please. Nicodemus was a real man. He was religious. He often went to the temple, his type of church. But he wasn't born again. You've come to church. Are you born again? You see, this subject tonight divides this congregation into two groups. And you, you, are either in one of either of those two groups. You say, what is... I'm not talking about boy-girl. I'm not talking about left-right. I'm not talking about old-young, tall-short, spiritually alive, or spirit Born again! or you're not born again. If you're in the not born again, then our plea with you tonight would be to cry out to God that he might save you. He has shown you tonight that you're not born again and you need to be. And only he can do it. Cast away from all your sins which you have committed. And get a new heart and a new spirit, God says. For why should you die? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. May God be pleased.
by the work of his Holy Spirit, by the sovereign move of God the Father's own outworking of his will through the word of truth, bring forth souls into light tonight. We're going to close our meeting in a word of prayer. Please pray with us.